Hello again. This is chapter 14, White Collar Crime, Organized Crime, and Cybercrime. So the chapter really looks at the criteria that experts use to distinguish white collar crime from traditional forms of offending and some of the criticisms of those criteria. Also, the chapter evaluates the ways that corporate crimes harm society in terms of physical and property damage, as well as weakening the moral fabric of society. So we're going to look at the various types of white collar crime and some of the impacts of that, and then some of the theoretical explanations of white collar crime. So we'll also look at the complexities in understanding and defining organized crime and the different types of criminal organizations identified by the criminal justice system and different criminal justice responses to organized crime. And then, of course, how do the theories, um, how can they be applied and enhance our understanding of organized crime? So then we'll compare and contrast the similarities and differences between traditional forms of crime and cybercrime. So we're going to go through like what are cybercrimes? What are the different kinds? And some of the legislation that's been enacted to address cybercrime. And of course, add some theories. OK, so let's jump in. OK, so the chapter really, again, um, a large focus of the chapter is white collar crime. You know, despite years of being relatively ignored by researchers, white collar crime is currently receiving much more attention, probably due to high profile um, cases. You know, you have like the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, as an example. And why was Bernie Madoff really held accountable for what he did? Largely because the people he robbed were rich people. Right. So we'll get into that a little bit. But, um, you know, some high profile CEOs and celebrities have been charged and convicted of illegal business practices. It's funny, the book uses the example of Martha Stewart. But again, she was there for kind of a technicality of, you know, trading stocks and things like this. So, um, you know, there are many ways in which white collar crimes operate. And in so many ways, when we go back to what we understand about deviance, the real key takeaway is that because we associate crime with certain communities, our negative association of those communities affects our, our understanding of crimes, right? So for example, why is it that we don't take white collar crime seriously if you think about the you know, recession that um, was the result of you know, these banksters, as <laughs> some of them are called, uh, manipulating interest rates and other factors? Um, and then basically, you know, um, the implosion of the housing market where you had folks writing these um, these kind of loans that basically they knew that people weren't going to be able to afford them when they were adjustable rate mortgages. So they called them subprime mortgages, which, you know, woof. anyway, long backstory. But basically, it's as if well, so the bankers were able to make money off of this by betting against those commodities. So for example, it's like if I sold you a product that I know is going to break, and then I bet on the stock market that it's going to break, right? So they basically were, you know, to the detriment of our entire society, you know, um, filling their pockets with money, right? And these people didn't go to jail, they were bailed out by uh, the kind of normal taxpayers of America, not the wealthy business class. And as a result, um, these things are going to continue to happen, right? So we have to go back to that deviance framework of like, why don't we take corporate crime seriously? If these people can destroy the entire world's economy with a couple clicks, why don't we fear that more than street crime? Like someone, you know, pulling out a knife and, and robbing someone on the street for 20 bucks because of who we associate with these crimes. White collar crimes are done by the most powerful people in society. People who are often white, people who are often rich, people who are, again, the top of their field, CEOs, or often, um, you know, like the Martha Stewart example, people who are well-known celebrities. So <laughs> we don't think of them as bad, right? Because the offenders upper class, that really affects our perceptions of what they're doing is wrong. Because in our whole culture, I mean, not to get super Marxian with you, but, you know, conflict theory would point out that, you know, we have this kind of false consciousness where the majority of society really wants to be rich. So we don't hold the rich accountable in a lot of ways because we hope to be them one day. So anyway, let's get into some of the specific stuff in the chapter. So, um, 
you know, experts in the area of white collar crime consider it one of the most difficult concepts to define, and there's very little consistency from researcher to the researcher. And that makes it problematic because we need to have shared definitions if we want to have clear empirical research on the topic. So the first prominent acknowledgement of white collar crime as an important concept for criminologists to study was presented at the American Sociological Society conference in 1939 by Edward Sutherland. And let me just say, um, <laughs> the American Sociological Society, one of the worst acronyms. Okay, I'll just let you think that for a second. Okay, so Sutherland coined the term white collar crime and is generally considered the most prominent criminologist in the 20th century. So he didn't provide a clear definition of what white collar crime was, but he simply presented a variety of cases that seemed to apply. So he talked about some of the racketeering cases of Al Capone in Chicago, as well as the Federal Trade Commission's investigations of automobile companies that were falsely advertising low interest rate loans. So his discussion also included cases in which judges and other officials accepted bribes or engaged in other unethical practices in which they abused the power of their positions. So perhaps the reason why Sutherland did not look to find a clear definition of crime in his address was that first he needed to convince other academics that white collar crime is really an actual serious form of criminal activity that should be taken seriously. Although most of the textbook claim that Sutherland introduced the concept of corporate, occupational, or industrial crimes, that's not true. Specifically prior to Sutherland's address, there were numerous scientific studies on white-collar bandits, robber barons, corporate crime, muckrakers, industrial crime, all of which refer to corporate, industrial, occupational, and political corruption. Right. So think about the ways in which, um, for instance, Side note, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we now know that a lot of these oil companies actually knew what they were doing to the environment um, now, even decades before we thought they knew, right? So we knew that um, because of internal memo releases that ExxonMobil knew as early as the 1970s, but now newer releases are showing other oil companies knowing within the 1950s that burning fossil fuels was going to create climate change and they did nothing. It's actually more than they did nothing. They funded research that said, no, it's not real. But you have these companies, again, out there lying to the American public, funding research to create division and, and confusion in a pretty clearly demonstrable scientific issue. So that's kind of an example, right? But again, um, going back to Sutherland, that the offender be upper class, committed violations that are work related, um, the work-related violations of blue-collar workers are excluded. Why? Because they don't have the power to influence the actual operation of an industry. So anyway, despite the criteria established by Sutherland, the term white-collar crime was both criticized and loosely applied to a variety of behaviors, particularly by researchers in the 40s through the 60s. You know, some of the cause of confusion comes to defining white-collar crime when there's a variety of other terms that are typically used synonymously right? Such as corporate crime, organizational crime, occupational crime, upper world crime, which is a weird one. I've never heard that one before. Actually, we're, you know, you've heard underworld crime, but not upper world crime. Um, business crime, right? Or any of that as opposed to street crime. So despite those criticisms and ongoing disagreements among criminologists about a clear definition of white collar crime, a short list of the general categories of various white collar offenses includes fraud, which is behaviors like tax evasion and false advertising. So an example of that could be the case brought about the uh, Trump Corporation within um, New York, right? Where basically <laughs> before there was even a trial, the judge was like, yeah, no, there's absolutely enough evidence that uh, that Trump Organization had been inflating its assets for the purpose of valuation and then deflating its assets for the purpose of taxing. So if you didn't read about it, Google it. You should know about what's going on in the world, especially when it comes to someone that's like high profile enough that they're, you know, trying to run for those kind of elected offices. But anyway, um, what the Trump Corporation did, just in brief, is like, let's say you owned a house, right? Which I don't, but let's pretend I do, <laughs> right? Let's pretend I own a house and I want to get it appraised. And they say, hey, that crappy condo you're in, in Southern California, that's worth somewhere between $450,000 and $650,000, right? Or let's just say between 
you know, five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars. Let's just make it a little bit more even. So the idea is for most people, they tend to use the lower range for what they get taxed for. Right. So I'd say, oh, for the taxation purposes, mm, five hundred thousand. And then maybe the highest range when trying to sell or put these things on the market, like, OK, it's worth up to six hundred thousand. See, but what the Trump organization did was like so egregious, like tripling, quadrupling, sometimes even more inflating the, the value of their assets. So it would be like me saying, OK, my house is probably valued or my condo is probably about a hundred or I'm sorry, five hundred thousand in value for taxation purposes, but then I'd say, but for valuation purposes, for me to get other loans and, and other collateral, the house is worth $5 million, <laughs> right? So it's just so obvious and egregious and a pattern of behavior that had been happening for over 30 years of that company's business. Um, the, basically, the judge didn't even hit a trial. He was just like, oh, yeah, no, for sure, this is a problem. And, and that's why, um, you know, that, that fraud case, is, that's an example of that, right? I mean, tax evasion is a whole nother thing. We can get into that all day. Also, former President Trump. Very, very um, obvious stuff there. OK, um, labor violations include different forms of harassment and dangerous working conditions that can cause injuries and death. Right. So the fact that a lot of these. Um, OK, another. OK, let me give you a little somewhat recent example of that. There was a case. Um, I'm trying to remember when that was not that long ago with um, Amazon where there were there was a factory that was in the path of a tornado and they made them remain open anyway and as a result of the um you know kind of dangerous weather situation part of the factory collapsed and killed some of the workers within there so that would be kind of an example of dangerous working conditions that caused injuries and death that were just completely unnecessary but you know people need their packages and you're like there's a tornado outside <laughs> like let people go home to safety and to be with their families. Okay, there's also manufacturing violations. So this includes the production and distribution of unsafe consumer products, as well as environmental regulations, I mean violations, such as, um, you know, dumping toxic waste or, you know, filling rivers with pollutants that forever contaminate that ecosystem. And that's incredibly common. And for me, the saddest part is a lot of these things are like pay a fine and not like clean up that river, which is very problematic. Um, there's also unfair business practices that includes things like insider trading, uh, bid rigging, antitrust violations and illegal mergers. So really basically kind of like rubbing elbows with other folks and gaming the system for their own benefit. So this has gotten the most attention in the in the media, largely because of the prosecution of high ranking business executives in the US, which is very rare <laughs> for how often these things are levied. Um, abuse of authority. This can take many forms, including bribery, extortion, brutality, kickbacks. And this is one of the more known categories for criminal justice practitioners. And last up is regulatory or administrative violations. So this is there's established federal, state and local agencies that govern the functioning of business and other organizations. So this could be, you know, using copyrighted, trademarked material. Like, for example, I had a friend that um, she was she got jury duty and ended up on this jury. And the whole thing was about copyright, trademark and patent infringements, because it was like a nepotism hire where basically like this dude hired his nephew because, you know, it's his nephew, even though the dude did not have like the experience or qualifications, he got that job. And then he decided to take the proprietary information from that company, like, you know, things that they had uh, trademarked, you know, uh, and patented, like certain, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what the industry was, but it was like, you know, these specific technological advancements. And he basically tried to start his own company, just cutting and pasting the stuff that they had <laughs> to the point where like, literally the watermarks from the original company were actually still on his designs. Like he didn't even cut and paste correctly. So, um, you know, it was pretty, you know, a cut and dry case there for their for their jury duty service. So anyway, um, you know, there's a lot there when it comes to um, all the kind of white collar offenses that can happen. And if you think about it, just how much those things can have huge impacts on society. Right. So again, moving on to impacts on society, um, you know, Sutherland 
in his first study, examined the decisions of courts and regulatory commissions against the 70 largest mercantile and industrial corporations in the nation. And again, this was like a long ass time ago. But anyway, uh, <laughs> he found that 547 adverse decisions had been made against these 70 companies, with an average of almost eight per corporation. Even more surprising was the prevalence of the substantiated rule violations. Specifically, every single one of the corporations that Sutherland included in his sample had a decision against it, which implies that all highly successful businesses in the U.S. had engaged and been caught in unethical practices. And perhaps the most shocking was that virtually every corporation committed more than one offense, with 97.1% recidivizing. Again, meaning... They get caught and then they just do it again. 97%, right? So <laughs> this is why when people are like, we don't need regulations because that slows down business. Uh, yeah, no, we obviously need regulations because these boys are, you know, it's the, the, you put a kid in charge of the candy jar, right? Like you put a kid and you say, hey, don't eat those cookies. And they're holding the cookie jar. They're going to eat those cookies, right? Because they have their hand in the jar. So obviously you can't let people with that kind of power and influence police themselves. <laughs> Clearly. Only 9% of the decisions that, you know, in his study were made by criminal courts. The others were made mostly by federal or state oversight agencies. They give them kind of a slap on the wrist or tell them to change policies. But people aren't going to jail. Businesses aren't being shuttered. Um, this very pro-business atmosphere in kind of the capitalism in our country. And of course, that's going to impact us seeing this as like, well, who wouldn't try to get a more favorable deal for themselves? And you're like, someone who's ethical, <laughs> right? So um, the question he had was, has the increased amount of laws, regulatory codes, and investigations lowered this rate of violations, right? So we know that he was looking at corporations like pre-1940s. So the problem is we don't really know for sure, since there's not a consistent measure of these violations from the 1940s to now, if the things are better or worse now. I mean, hint, they're worse, but okay. <laughs> Given the recent revelations regarding the extensive amount of grossly unethical practices at some of the nation's most respected and successful corporations, especially with, with those like, oh man, see, you're too young to remember the Enron scandal. Ooh, Google it. Right. There's some of those ones, a Worldcom, Adelphia, these corporations that basically um, were just completely corporately criminally lying to their shareholders, to the public. Um, and then what happens when they fail? They give all their money back and all the rich people go home. No, I'm just kidding. The, oftentimes, like even in these situations where these places fail, these people often get golden parachutes, which means the CEO who basically just drove unethically a corporation into the ground. They get a hefty amount of money instead of going to jail. Let's see, the economic cost. It goes in this economic cost, physical costs. So there's no doubt that white collar crime causes far more financial damage to society than all of the crimes combined. Yet, even if they're far more costly, um, they're often not considered criminal. Or if they're technically criminal, um, they're often not prosecuted. And if they're prosecuted, they're often not punished. And if they're punished, it's often very mildly punished. Like for instance, um, oh God, I still can't remember the name of that bank. It's like HBC something, ah, whatever. Um, basically there's like one of these major American banks that laundered money for Mexican drug cartels and their punishment when they got caught was, okay, pay us a couple million dollars, which is like not even one day's operating uh, profits. So think about it. If you like, like, let's say you were laundering money for Mexican drug cartels. And then I said, Hey, that's illegal. You can't do that. You have to pay me $20. You'd be like, here's a 20 bucks. I'm just going to keep doing it. <laughs> right? Because think about going back to some of the other theories we talked about when you weigh the pros and cons of, of committing a crime, if the consequences for the crime are incredibly low, it's not going to serve the, the punishment of a deterrent is not going to be there because you're like, well, I'll just give them 20 bucks and I'll be on my way and just committing crimes again, right? So we have to really think, even though uh, millions might sound like a lot to us, we have to look at it within the context of their actual profit margins to see whether or not this is something that would actually impact the company and hopefully change the behaviors in the future to reduce that 97% recidivism. 
So anyway, some modern estimates by the FBI's UCR or Uniform Crime Report have put the cost of all street cl crimes as close to about 17 billion for, um, you know, and their estimates are from back in the day. But, um, you know, when it comes to just like one company like Enron, that had estimated losses of 60 billion. And the savings and loan industry bailout from 1989, again, you don't remember that, estimated cost to taxpayers was almost $500 billion. Right. So and that's by the year 2020, meaning we bail these things out and they don't go away. They just go into our deficit. So basically your tax dollars, the, the kind of issues with the economy itself now is impacted from these kind of pro corporate taxation policies, these ways that we've kind of let um, these industries really drive themselves into the ground. And instead of saying, oh, now we care about the free market, you messed up, you fail. That's what the free market says. All of a sudden, we become very socialist when it comes to we got to save these banks. They're too big to fail. Right. But if your company, if you did a bad job at your company, your small business, you racked up your credit cards and you lied and you extorted money and you, you know, did all these illegal things, you go to jail your company would close. You'd have financial consequences. And that's often just not the case when it comes to this stuff. So it's a pretty shocking comparison <laughs> to see that. And a very, very conservative estimate from the total economic cost of white collar crime per year is about 500 billion. So more than 30 times greater than that for street crime. And yet we don't take it seriously. We don't think it's a big deal. But we don't realize like when they do these things, these are sometimes like some of this money that they're gambling away. It actually can be like people's pensions. So for example, you know, the corporation, that guy gets his golden parachute and gets out of there. But then all the people that worked for that corporation for over 30, 40 years, they get nothing, even though they worked into that, they paid into their pensions. Um, that money's gone, right? And they're screwed. So we should take this stuff more seriously is what I'm trying to say. Okay, um, there's also really briefly physical costs, right? That corporate crime kills, maims, and injures large numbers of innocent people, much more so than street crimes. So for example, one study showed a conservative estimate that at least 105,000 people die annually due to corporate crime. This includes about 55,000 employees who get harmed by working, like occupational illnesses or poisonings. Um, another 30,000 are consumer deaths that come from unsafe products. And at least 20,000 more citizens who die each year from a variety of environmental pollution. Right? So you have these companies that they're, you know, putting contaminants in the water, in the air, in all of these systems, and those have real net consequences for human health and and you know um society so these estimates don't include people who die from falsely prescribed or marketed pharmaceutical drugs like criminally negligent nursing homes or medical care or the estimated 4.1 million people that are harmed but not killed at work it appears that corporate crime causes at least seven times more deaths than traditional street crimes. So you're saying conservative estimate, seven times more death, 30 times more financial costs to society. Yet, we don't care. Additionally, it appears that the rate of homicides and assaults due to street crime has been cut in half over the last 25 years. Whereas there's no indication that deaths or injuries due to corporate crimes have decreased. On the contrary, there's a ton of evidence that they've increased, right? So, you know, some argue that there's, this kind of leads to a breakdown in the social fabric, right? Because um, we focus so much on the street crimes, we don't see the corporate crimes that are actually impacting all of us every day. And these people are making a ton of money um, knowingly harming other people. Okay, so crimes against the environment, woof, we could do like a whole chapter just on that. So I'll try to be brief, but I can't, I just can't. Um, so there's been forms of pollution throughout human civilization, but the real turn for the worse is, of course, the Industrial Revolution. In the pre-industrial period, you know, um, you were farming the land you were on, so you'd treat the, the land well. But when the Industrial Revolution takes place, you have numbers of countless numbers of factories and plants that had no concern for the environment they were in. And this resulted in unprecedented dumping of deadly chemicals and waste products into bodies of water, toxins being released um, from endless streams of smoke coming out of factory chimneys, and the massive destruction of majestic forests and national resources that were 
you know, chop down to, you know, sometimes just even for cattle to graze on or to, you know, to use that lumber for material building. In the 20th century, it became obvious how much damage had been done during the Industrial Revolution, and we started to restrict the harm against the environment. So many laws and regulations were passed, and entire federal, state, and local agencies like the EPA were created, right? The Environmental Protection Agency. It's not a cabinet agency, but the administration that's appointed by the president is normally given a cabinet rank. So the EPA starts in 1970, kind of ironically under Nixon, and is charged with protecting human health and safeguarding the natural environment, which is quite a burden. So for instance, the US contains 30,000 waste sites, along with over 10 billion pounds of toxic chemicals that pose a significant threat of pollution. And the EPA estimates are that there's approximately 60,000 deaths of mostly elderly and young children um, each year in the US as a direct result of toxic particles emitted in pollution from manufacturing plants. In one recent year, the EPA identified 149 manufacturing plants throughout the nation where air in nearby communities were tested as being toxic and dangerous. And I mean, there's a whole other level to this. Take my social problems class and we'll talk about that. The aspect of environmental racism, that these, the toxic industrial plants, the petrochemical plants that make plastics, the oil refineries, the garbage incinerators and dumps, they are not in wealthy communities that they are not in the white collar folk communities, right? They are in the poor communities, the communities of color. And so the people that have the least power over this whole situation are the ones who bear the brunt of the most toxicity and the most life ending consequences of this stuff. So the EPA often works with the Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture to develop and enforce regulations to protect the environment from corporate crimes, though, hand to asterisk, um, just Google EPA and, and how it was affected during the Trump administration. They put a lot of handcuffs on things like they basically created a lawsuit to challenge whether or not the Clean Air Act means that the EPA can monitor how clean the air is. And it's like, it seems pretty clear. <laughs> Right. Um, or, you know, certain things like because certain um, maybe watersheds were not included in some of the specific language of the EPA created stuff in the 1970s. They're like, well, then that means that they're not liable to keeping clean and that the EPA has no jurisdiction over these things, which they obviously do, because the whole point is the Environmental Protection Agency. But if a lawyer can argue it in court and they can get those exemptions and they have the money and the time to do this that the federal government does not have, um, then yeah, we end up in a situation where the consequences really are levied on the poorest and the most marginal in society. So the EPA does have regulations um, that look at you know air pollution, water pollution, preserving the forests and natural areas that um, look through hazardous waste disposal and protecting endangered species. And this has been one of the most common corporate violations over the last few decades is really the environmental aspect. And then lastly, labor violations. Another one, uh, another very common corporate violation involves crimes against the people who work for their businesses. And some of these violations range from hiring illegal workers, AKA children. Again, Google it. There's been a lot of recent um, journalism about the fact that in a few states around the country, they're trying to actually pass laws to protect corporations against cl uh, charges of, you know, child labor exploitation, right? And they even found like major corporations, like such as uh, McDonald's is one of the examples. They found children as young as 10 years old working in these. And now there's a couple very red states in the country that are trying to pass these laws to basically make it so that kids as young as 13, 14, 15 years old can be working in more dangerous industries that are prone to hazardous accidents like construction or factory labor or um, what's it called? Um, you know, meat packing plants and things of that nature where there's like lots of knives and lots of uh, problems, right? So anyway, um, yeah, children shouldn't be working right? Also, the workers that are there, if legal age or not, should um, not be exploited or um, exposed to unsafe working conditions. So the primary legislation developed to investigate labor violations is the Occupational Safety and Health Act, or called OSHA, which was passed in 1970 and made it a misdemeanor to cause the death of a worker by willfully violating safety laws. And it remains a misdemeanor to this day. A misdemeanor right? You can go to jail uh, with a mandatory minimum for having, you know, um, 
like a small amount of possession of, of certain controlled substances. And yet it's a misdemeanor to kill a person because you were willfully violating safety laws. So OSHA is charged with establishing and enforcing standards of safety for American workers. And, you know, they talk about research in the book from, you know, almost 20 years ago, so I don't know why. But anyway, um, in 2003, they conducted approximately 40,000 inspections, finding 83,000 violations. So violators are sometimes fined, but even the fines are very low in relation to the profits that are being made by those companies. So again, it's a slap on the wrist. That's why they don't change their policies. And OSHA rarely pursues criminal charges. Between 1970 and 2002, they only referred 151 cases to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution. And of those 151 cases, only 11 resulted in prison sentences, with the maximum sentence being six months. So you can see how not seriously we take these issues. Moving on to theoretical explanations of white collar crime. A recent review of the extant scientific research testing the empirical validity of various theories um, in trying to understand white collar crime found that some theories do it better than others, obviously. Specifically, you know, studies that were examining the theories of differential association um, or social learning or things like techniques of neutralization, right? Where they basically just tell themselves like, it's for the greater good, it's for my pocketbook, it's so I can, you know, buy an even bigger yacht to put my other yacht inside of. Um, or deterrence, rational choice theory, the idea that the, the cost of these things is so low, it becomes almost a rational choice to offend, and there's like very little deterrence. Um, they also apply things like cultural or subcultural theories, routine activities or opportunity strain theories, um, low self-control theory, right? And as well as the political and economic ideologies of capitalism and the kind of how the ideologies that, def that defend capitalism, especially in opposition to communism or socialism, um, are used as a justification for these really horrible exploitive, it's, if anything, they just give more credence to communism, socialism. So anyway, um, one recent study showed that executive MBA candidates who had much experience in the corporate world were significantly more likely to use neutralization techniques to explain why they agreed to market and sell an admittedly dangerous drug than normal MBA students who had far less experience in the corporate world. Right? So just being in that world, it's like a, its own subculture where you just go, ah, screw people. Who cares about what they want, right? Let's make more money. And if that becomes the focus, then it's really a lot easier for people to try and find ways to justify the horrible stuff. And again, <laughs> everything reminds me of The Simpsons. There's that great, you know, uh, example for The Simpsons where, you know, um, they're trying out like Homer's a guinea pig for medical research and they're trying to figure out, you know, um, this diet pill that will make, you know, suppress his hunger and there's food going right in front of him. And they're like, wow, you're not eating the food. It must be working. And he's like, there's food in front of me. I can't see anything. <laughs> and the one person turns to the other and says, well, how are we going to sell a drug that makes you go blind? And the other one says, let's let marketing worry about that. Right. So it's often this kind of technique of neutralization of it's not our problem. Let's pass that on. Let's kick that down the line. As long as we say in the commercial, make cause, blah, 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 blah. Like, and you see in the, all those uh, advertisements for pharmaceuticals. Um, and it's always like, it's so much worse than just having allergies. It'll be like, you can die, or like your nose will fall off and everyone will hate you. Like, it's always like these crazy side effects that um, you're like, wow, I just didn't want to have allergies that bad. So, um, and that, even that, even the way that they have to tell you what the consequences are is only a product of consumer legislation to force them to, because otherwise they used to just not mention any of the side effects at all. Um, which is incredibly problematic. Actually, I mean, it's really just problematic that they advertise pharmaceuticals at all. It's not a normal thing in other countries. But anyway, side note. So studies have shown that the more often a company is caught for violations, the more likely they are to engage in those acts in the future. That's messed up. So that's problematic. So this is easily understood by the simple fact that the very companies that have been caught have gotten away with it. And often by the time they get caught, they've done this for many years without being caught. And they know the potential benefits far outweigh any sanctions they may face when they're caught for a few of their total violations. 
So portions of rational choice theory are strongly supported by empirical research in the sense that the benefits for the payoff of, for violating ethical business rules is, a, you know, there's much more gain um, than there is a consequence, right? Especially in terms of financial profit or employers' recognition of their behaviors. So um, also, you know, briefly opportunity theories like routine activities theory talk about how there's a ready-made opportunity to commit various white collar crimes. It's quite attractive because of the low likelihood of getting caught. And then, um, you know, in terms of conflict theory, especially regarding the overall political or economic ideology of various corporations, um, studies show that whether a company is based in more communist countries versus capitalistic countries, the goal is profit. Specifically, studies have shown that white collar crime exists at a very high rate in more socialist and communist countries as well. So it's not like, okay, well, maybe communism will do it better. It's the organization of the companies themselves, right? So we have to really look at this and say, why is it that we've been able to, in the last 25 years, really cut street crime and especially the violent like uh, murders and things like that in half? And yet we've done nothing to address these things. Okay, so um, moving on to organized crime, right? What is it? <laughs> so the book basically says that um, one approach to defining it is to incorporate a typology that includes factors like, you know, the means of obtaining goals, aka violence, theft, corruption, um, and the reasons for engaging in those activities, like money, right? Like why do you engage in an illegal uh, organized crime syndicate? money, right? And this could be through common crime, through illegal business practices, or even really through legal that aren't prosecuted business practices. Or sometimes um, in the typology also includes a political objective, right? So there's no real agreed upon definition of organized crime, but Howard Abedinsky listed various factors identified by law enforcement agencies and researchers that are associated with organized crime. Organized crime is non-ideological, right? It's not about one particular view or, or belief system. It's really about money. Um, organized crime is very hierarchical, just like businesses are. It also has limited or exclusive membership, right? You're not just going to walk in and be like, hi, can I join your mob, please? Can I please be a part of this gang syndicate, right? <laughs> You're going to be pretty limited or exclusive in how you get into those groups. Um, it perpetuates itself, and organized crime is willing to use illegal violence and bribery to keep itself running. Also, it consists of a specialization or division of labor. It's very monopolistic. The whole point is to be the monopoly. And um, it's governed by some rules and regulations even within those, those uh, groups. Okay, let's look at the historical context of organized crime in the U.S. So organized crime did not begin with 20th century prohibition. It began with colonial pirates. And some argue that pirates during the American colonial era were a form of organized crime because they developed a well-structured hierarchical organization as well as engaged in non-ideological goals that had restricted membership. By the turn of the 19th century, New York was the entrepreneurial center of the country, and the city was also the center for conspiracies, crooks, and criminals. In the 1850s, gangs began to dominate the criminal arena. These gangs included the 40 Thieves, the Hudson Dudsters, the Short Tails, and the Dead Rabbits. And they evolved when groups of immigrants banded together for protection, as well as the exploitation of other immigrants. If you haven't seen it, uh, Gangs of New York, great film done about this that really kind of goes into that history and some of the amazing actors in that film. Um, so these gangs eventually formed partnerships with the political machines of the time in an effort to control the vice enterprises. One notorious political machine was Tammany Hall. Again, in that film, if you watch it, <laughs> in Gangs of New York, you'll see a lot of that. It was founded in 1789 to oppose the ruling conservative Federalist Party, and a primary strength of Tammany Hall was its skill to elect candidates to the state legislator in Albany, and the Board of Aldermen in New York City, so they basically were able to kind of get their people into positions of power to make sure that they got exceptions or the laws kind of got changed or not applied to them. In, um, you know, 1919, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was passed outlawing the manufacture, sale, distribution, and transportation of alcoholic beverages, aka Prohibition, 
and prohibition created a huge opportunity for criminals. It's a basic supply and demand, right? People wanted liquor, and now the government says you can't have it. So guess what happens, right? <laughs> With that passage of the 18th Amendment, you know, um, there was a need for major infrastructure to meet the public demand for alcohol. Again, production, transportation, and importation. So Prohibition and the Chicago political machine created one of the most notorious criminal organizations in this country's history, right? And one of those infamous people from the, you know, kind of epitomized the Chicago gang life is Al Capone, right? He made so much money. I mean, they all made so much money. The mob was basically the government made the mob incredibly powerful by causing Prohibition. Basically, they were making money hand over fist, and the more money they made, the more powerful they became, and many of these gangs continued to operate as they did, you know, early on, meaning using a lot of violence to obtain control. So in 1931, the state of Nevada legalized gambling, right? Meaning the mafia basically built Vegas. Shock. Right? Um, and so... Nevada creating legalized gambling created tax revenue during the Great Depression, and Bugsy Siegel was the first significant criminal to realize the potential of legalized gambling. In 1947, the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada was opened, and this opening designated the onset of organized crime control of the legal gambling industry. Many of the lavish hotels, like the Flamingo, were controlled through hidden interests by organized crime. And usually money was skimmed before it was counted for tax purposes, and the money was distributed to the organized crime bosses in proportion to their hidden ownership. In 1986, the President's Commission on Organized Crime noted the various developments in organized crime during the preceding 20 years, and there were three developments that were very significant. One is the increased awareness that organized crime groups exist. The, the second was the success of law enforcement against the leadership membership and associates of La Cosa Nostra, which was considered by some to be the best known organized crime group in the last 30 years at that time. And the third significant development was organized crime's involvement in drug trafficking. So moving on to types of criminal organizations, you got the mafia that we're talking about, the origins are unclear. Some people say that it evolved as a 9th century response to Arabic domination of Sicily. Another view is the Mafia evolved in Palermo, Italy in 1282 as a political organization to free Sicily of French domination. Originally, the Mafia was similar to an extended social family. The members took an oath swearing under punishment of death to a code of silence. And initially, the Mafia was a self-protection group, but by the 1860s, they expanded to criminal activities like smuggling, cattle rustling, and extortion. In 1878, the Italian government began concentrated efforts to eliminate the Sicilian Mafia. Thus, many Sicilian mafiosi immigrated to the United States, settling in major urban cities like Boston, Chicago, Kansas City, New Orleans, New York, and St. Louis. So from 1890 to the 1920s, the mafiosi preyed on other immigrants by forcing their participation in protection scams, right? Where they basically say, hey, uh, you got to pay us for protection so that, you know, um, if you don't, we're going to come and just kind of like destroy your business. Fast forward to the late 1940s, you start getting these outlaw motorcycle gangs. And these evolved as disorganized, unruly groups made up of disgruntled World War II veterans. Through the decades, the tough guy image was perpetuated and membership increased as well as the organization and sophistication of these groups. So some of these groups' behavior was less rebellious rather than openly criminal. Outlaw motorcycle gangs today are secretive and close-knit groups with selective membership. Membership in an OMG is symbolized by colors, which are often on denim or leather jackets with embroidered patches sewn on the back. And these patches display a gang logo and may include rockers that identify the name of the gang and the home city of the chapter. The colors of the members, it's their basically most prized possession, and it represents their primary commitment to the gang and to that criminal lifestyle. So a big part of OMGs is terrible, outrageous treatment of women who associate with those members. Women are considered less important than the gang itself or the member's motorcycle. In some gangs, women are used to generate money through prostitution, as well as for the transportation of drugs and weapons. Some of the most notorious OMGs 
include Hell's Angels. If you haven't read the book by Hunter S. Thompson, it's pretty great, honestly. Hunter S. Thompson, uh, if you don't know him, you should know him. But anyway, he, um, he, he was one of his first books, Hell's Angels. Um, and of course, there are more than just, you know, the Hell's Angels, um, but they are very sophisticated, wide-ranging counterintelligence structures that they have themselves to protect from arrest and prosecution. And there's smaller, well-known ones as well. Right, you got the Vagos located in the West and Southwest, the Warlocks in Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware, the Dirty Dozen in Arizona, the Gypsy Jokers in the Pacific Northwest, and the Sons of Silence in Colorado. And of course, um, the Sons of Anarchy. No, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> but again, um, part of that is really, you know, pretty... Uh, if you watch any of those shows like Mayans or Sons of Anarchy, it's a pretty good reflection of, you know, the kind of complicated nature of those particular um, groups. So anyway, um, there's also prison gangs, right? You have um, a lot of this really comes back to the 1964 U.S. Supreme Court decision in a case called Cooper versus Pate. And the decision allowed prisoners to sue state officials in federal court, which resulted in a great deal of litigation and changed the prison conditions in the 1970s. And this is when gangs grew in this more liberal prison environment. So prior to Cooper v. Pate, only Washington and California reported the existence of prison gangs. But by 1984, this number rose to over 60% of state and federal prisons had gang activity. By the 90s, some of these prison gangs had evolved into well-organized criminal groups. And these gangs were different from previous gangs, primarily with their demand of absolute obedience to the parent group. For instance, the death oath or the blood in, blood out kind of idea requires that members always remain a member. Organized in the late 1950s and one of the oldest prison gangs is the Mexican Mafia, whose members are primarily Mexican-Americans from Southern California. In some prisons, the Mexican Mafia controls homosexual prostitution, gambling, and narcotics. Both inside and outside prison, the Mexican Mafia is involved in burglary, assault, robberies, extortion, drug trafficking, and contract killings. Um, another major prison gang is La Nuestra Familia, Familia uh, considered to be an enemy of the Mexican Mafia, sometimes just called the family. Um, this prison gang was established in Soledad Prison in California in 1967. And some of the Familia's um, outside prison operation includes protection rackets, similar to traditional organized crime groups. The Texas Syndicate originated in Folsom Prison in California in 1974. It's, it's crazy how many are in California. And um, the members are predominantly Mexican-Americans from the El Paso and San Antonio, Texas region. It has a reputation for being one of the most violent gangs. Um, the Black Gorilla Family was established by Black activist prisoner George Jackson in San Quentin Prison, 1996, also California. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this gang is closely associated with the Crips street gang. And so the BGF is controlled by a central committee consisting of generals, captains, lieutenants, and soldiers. And the Aryan Brotherhood is a motorcycle-oriented white supremacist gang also founded in San Quentin's prison in the 1960s, California. The Aryan Brotherhood's criminal activities include extortion, protection, drug rackets, contract murder, and just being racist pieces of garbage. So there's also, you know, urban street gangs, which is another factor of this. And there's so many. I'm not going to be like, here's all the names of the gangs, right? But really... You know, um, researchers Kenny and Fickenauer evaluated whether urban street gangs could be deemed as their own organized criminal groups and defined certain characteristics of these gangs. So the first characteristic is corruption. At this time, there's no evidence to support the notion that urban street gangs systematically engage in paying off public officials in an effort to avoid arrest and prosecution. The second characteristic is violence or the threat of violence. This is a major feature of urban street gangs. Third characteristic is continuity. This is a feature for certain street gangs. And the fourth characteristic is multiple enterprises, meaning the drug business is essentially the only enterprise for a lot of urban street gangs, though of course prostitution, gambling, other things like that are often still under that purview as well. So structured involvement in legitimate business is the fifth characteristic, and while some street gangs appear to have some type of organizational structure, there does not seem to be a great deal of expansion from a legal business into legal, so they're not necessarily 
uh, laundering that money into legitimate businesses, though sometimes that does happen. And the last characteristic is sophistication, discipline, and bonding. So while some gangs involve um, sophisticated activities, like, you know, using code when speaking to each other, most gangs don't. And in reference to discipline, many urban gangs stress the need for discipline, especially in the drug business. And lastly, many street gangs emphasize bonding, such as rituals and initiation rites. Okay, so let's look really briefly at criminal justice responses to organized crime. So the Chicago Crime Commission was formed in 1919 by a group of Chicago businessmen that were concerned about Chicago's gangland reputation. And some argued that the commission was a self-serving exercise in hypocrisy. However, it was able to demonstrate successfully the city's crime problem through a public relations campaign. And this introduced the public enemy list prior to uh, J. Edgar Hoover's version. There's also the Wickersham Commission that was formed in 1929 to assess the effect of prohibition on criminal activity. And the findings from the commission revealed that organized criminal activity flourished around bootlegging activities. Shock. Um, the Cave Over or CAFAVR committee um, is really, again, coming from Senator Estes CAFAVR, I can't say it right, um, who became chair of the special committee to investigate organized crime and interstate commerce. And the committee was charged with a couple different responsibilities, which was conducting an extensive study and investigation to assess whether organized crime uses the services, avenues, or interstate commerce to promote any transactions which violates federal and state law. And if those transactions are occurring, what kind of investigation is going on there? Also determining whether those interstate criminal operations were responsible for developing corrupting influences in violation of federal or state laws. So, um, you know, during his time as chair, he heard from more than 600 witnesses from places all over the country. And the committee did provide valuable information on organized crime, but the committee did not provide support to the existence of an international mafia conspiracy. Um, the McLennan Committee was in the early 60s, again, another senator, uh, Senator McLennan, um, who was formed to investigate labor racketeering in the country's trade unions. So in 1963, the committee held televised hearings, including the testimony of Joseph Velashi, the first made member of the Genovese crime family, to testify about an Italian-American organized crime. Uh, Velashi's testimony did not result in any convictions. Further, the McLennan Committee failed to recommend a specific definition of organized crime, but these hearings did contribute to the government's understanding of that kind of criminal activity. Uh, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice in 1965, this was President Lyndon Johnson, um, and there were nine different task forces under this banner, and one of them looked specifically at organized crime, and the commission maintained that, you know, obviously they were looking at things like the Cosa Nostra, and uh, they maintained that gambling was the largest source of revenue for organized crime, followed by loan sharking and narcotics trafficking. So the task force just kind of picked up from what the CAFAVR committee had done and made various recommendations, including creating a witness protection program, special federal grand juries, and legislation allowing electronic surveillance. So that's a big turn. And then um, you get to the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970. This was passed because of the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice. And a key component of this legislation was Title IX of the Act, specifically the Racketeer Influenced and Corruption Organizations, or RICO Act. And again, if you've ever watched like Sons of Anarchy or any of those shows, you know what RICO is. So basically, there are three criminal penalties for RICO violations, and these penalties can be applied simultaneously a fine of no more than $25,000, a prison term of no more than 20 years for each racketeering count, and the forfeiture of any interest obtained or maintained in the course of state violations. So when someone has a RICO case applied, it really opens up the kind of actions that law enforcement can do to track and monitor individuals. So the President's Commission on Organized Crime, this was the last one by Reagan in 1983 under Executive Order number 12435. I don't know why you need to know that. Um, they produced five reports in their three-year existence. And some of the key issues they looked at was money laundering, labor union racketeering, and mob lawyers. So they avoided focusing on Italian-American organized crime and instead focused on Colombian cocaine cartels as well as other criminal groups like outlaw motorcycle clubs. So the commission provided a more meaningful definition of organized crime, 
and in an effort to enhance their understanding of these groups, they developed a contingency model that highlights the levels of involvement of members and non-members. So here, just briefly, are those levels. The criminal group, so the core of the group. The protectors, these are the people that they pay off, you know, like uh, public officials, business persons, judges, attorneys, etc. Uh, specialized support were people who provided, you know, certain things for them. So let's say arsonists, pilots, chemists. Um, other support, this was consumers of organized crime legal goods. So, you know, people that buy drugs from the drug cartel, right? And then social support was providing the perception of legitimacy to these criminal groups. So this could be politicians who seek the support of organized crime members and community leaders who invite these crime members to social gatherings to make them look like they're not criminals. Okay, and then lastly, we have some theoretical on, uh, explanations of organized crime. So again, Kenny and Fickenauer reviewed various theoretical perspectives that attempt to provide an understanding of organized criminal behavior, such as cultural transmission, cultural conflict, and strain theories, and even um, low self-control theory. So um, let's see, they also talked about um, ethnicity and ethnic secession, meaning, you know, kind of the way in which a lot of these groups kind of came about as a result of not having a, like legitimate access in society. Um, so they created their own. Um, another theoretical perspective looks at enterprise theory. So this maintains that the legitimate marketplace doesn't provide an opportunity for customers to obtain certain goods and services, right? Like drugs. People want drugs, but they can't get them legally, so they go to these illegal places. Um, and Peter Reuter tried to understand what circumstances some gangs are deemed an organized crime group under. So he contends that adult gangs are primarily in existence for economic purposes and uh, that, you know, the supply and demand conditions are really what assist organized crime to flourish. So he said there's three things that affect the extent of organized crime, and it's the illegal market opportunities, meaning is there gambling, drugs, loan sharking? That's contingent upon groups of people. And of course, the you know, extent of recent migration, meaning people that can often be kind of exploited or recruited as potential clients for goods and services, and the strength and corruptness of the local political authority as well. Okay, briefly moving on to cybercrime. So what is cybercrime? It's any unauthorized or deviant or illegal activity over the internet that involves a computer or computers as the tool to commit the activity and a computer slash computers as the target of that activity. So cybercrime consists of at least three features. The act was committed with a computer, a victim computer, and an intermediary network. High technology crime refers to any criminal act involving the use of high technology devices during the commission of that act. So there's a lot of different categories under that banner. You have hacking, I mean we've all heard of this, um, you know, the idea that someone is breaking into a particular protected network um, in the computer science community. It's really interesting. There's not really that clear of a distinction between the people who are there to help protect the systems and the people who are hackers. That's why I think the government finds those hackers that are the most egregious and then just hires them. <laughs> right? But anyway, um, Robert Moore came up with six general types of hackers. Very briefly, we'll go through it. You have the black hat hackers. So these are the folks that violate computer security essentially for the purpose of being malicious or for personal gain. Um, you have white hat hackers. These are the people who are involved in writing programs to protect systems and networks from being illegally or maliciously accessed. You have gray hat, everyone's wearing a hat. You have gray hat hackers. This is a blend of black hat and white hat, right? That They might be considered opportunistic um, so they might target some things and, and protect others. And then you have script kitties. These are hackers that are deemed the lowest on the hacker ladder because they don't have very much technical ability. Um, you have hacktivists. So these are people that are similar to the white hat hackers, but they differ in their motives. Hacktivists are usually there to hack computer systems or networks that provide them with an avenue to spread a political message. And then there's cyber terrorists. These are individuals that access computer systems linked to critical infrastructure, like water purification, electricity, or nuclear power plants. And these attacks can cause damage and death, 
due to loss of service. So they're very dangerous. And so um, they're relatively new, but they're gaining a lot more attention, especially a great deal of public fear. Okay, there's also identity theft. We've all we've all seen that, right? That's a big problem these days. It's very difficult to keep your information private. And so there's typically three different types of identity theft. The first is when the identity theft or the identity thief assumes the life of the victim, right? Sometimes they'll take your social security number and then they'll pretend to be you, right? Um, that's crazy. The second form is virtual identity theft, where they steal another person's screen name potentially for the purpose of harassing people or using an account to spam others, right? Like let's say you leave a social media account by itself for a while. Sometimes people will you know, hack into that and then send out like weird messages from that. If you've ever experienced that, it's so strange. Like all your friends get some message like, hey, click on this link. And you're like, no, that wasn't me. And then the third form of identity theft occurs when a victim's credit identity is stolen, such as their social <clears throat> and other forms of identifying information. And this is the most common type. So the offender obtains the information and they're going to use it to apply for credit in that person's name. Right? And there's different ways to obtain an individual's identity. There's carding, which refers to stealing a victim's credit card information. Um, there's dumpster diving, which means you know people throw sometimes forms away that can have critical information on them that can be used by these people. There's credit card skimming, which is when offenders steal credit card information from a card being scanned through an electronic card reader. Like for instance, sometimes at like gas stations or places like that, they'll place them over top of those scanners. So if you ever go to a place and you see something that looks a little wonky like that, like it, it looks like it's been attached on top of something, don't use it. Um, and then shoulder surfing is basically when you peer over someone's shoulder to memorize their credit card number or you know maybe get their pin while they're paying for things. Another incredibly problematic and, and horrible cybercrime is child pornography, which is, you know, um, pornography involving children in sexual acts or in a sexual way. And, you know, users of internet child pornography generally fall into four categories. People who encourage prevailing or developing sexual interests in children, um, people who communicate with other sex offenders, um, individuals who are compulsive or curious, and individuals who are involved in that actual production of child pornography. Not necessarily because they are pedophiles, but because they're trying to make money. Okay, um, internet fraud. Um, two of the most common types of internet fraud are fraudulent online sales, which, oh my god, I've totally fallen for that stuff. I hate that so much. You know those things that, like, if it seems too good to be true, it's too good to be true, right? That's kind of what these ones are. So, um, they look like a real website and then you buy something and then you click on the thing later and you realize it leads to nothing. Um, I remember having a bank trying to explain to my bank like, hey, I bought this thing, but it was fraudulent. It's never come. It's whatever. And they're like, no, but their website goes to something. But I can't remember what it was that I was buying, but I just remember that the website that it linked to. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. It was like some um, VR thing I was trying to buy. And the website that it linked to was like pet leashes, like a dog collar, a cat collar. And uh, they were like, well, it links to a website, so it must be legitimate. And I'm like, no, that's not <laughs> website listed. It was fraudulent. And my stupid bank was like, no, nope, we're still giving them your money. Um, and then there's advanced fee frauds. These are where someone says, hey, uh, I'm a Nigerian prince. I just need you to give me a thousand dollars and then I'll give you a million dollars or something like that. So they manipulate people into sending them money. And then lastly, is cyber stalking. This is incredibly, incredibly problematic in our new social media world. This just means to engage in a course of conduct to communicate or cause to be communicated words, images, or language through the use of electronic mail or electronic communication directed at a person causing substantial emotional distress to that person and serving no legitimate purpose. So cyber stalking includes some of the following actions. Monitoring people's email with spyware or things that like uh, monitor their keystrokes on the computer, sending emails that threaten, insult, or harass, disrupting email communications by inundating someone's mailbox with a ton of unwanted mail, um, disrupting email communications by sending viruses, uh, using the victim's email identity or virtual identity theft to send false messages to others or to purchase goods and services. And the last one is using the internet to seek and collect a victim's personal information and whereabouts. Okay, so looking at some of the criminal justice responses to cybercrime, 
There have been investigations of cybercrime, but law enforcement has really lagged behind the remarkable technological advances. And so that means the easy accessibility of this technology to millions of people has opened up an opportunity for more crime. The number of large law enforcement agencies have devoted resources to electronic crime, but medium-sized agencies may not have those kind of units or be able to train people on those specific things. So small agencies do also experience computer, cr uh, computer crime, but they often don't have the resources for a specialized unit. So law enforcement agencies have to determine whether they'll be reactive or proactive when they investigate cybercrime. So cyber stalking and identity theft are almost always reactive, but things like digital child pornography can be viewed as proactive. And another facet of investigating cybercrime is warrants, right? So that you have to often get into the computer systems. You need to get a warrant to get into operating systems or storage devices. And you have to have specifications that are clearly articulated in the development of a comprehensive search warrant to make sure that you get to capture all what you're looking for. Okay, super brief. I'm going to go through some of the, they go through this in the book, so I'll just very brief, um, the relevant legislation. You have the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA, that um, initially enacted in the early 80s, but it's designed to protect national security, financial, commercial information, medical treatment, as well as interstate communication systems from malicious acts, including unauthorized, acts, unauthorized access. Um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, passed in the late 80s. And this is from pressure from the motion picture industry because people realized they could just burn the movies themselves, right? So this is from like record labels, software publishers, other people that wanted to protect the copyrights of their work. Um, then you have the Child Online Protection Act, or COPA, passed in 1998, that prohibits individuals from knowingly engaging in communication for commercial purposes that's available to any minors and includes material that is harmful to minors. Let's see, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, the ECPA, passed in 86, and regulates the interception of electronic communications by individuals as well as the government. You have the, let's see, um, oh, I should just say under that, malicious activities under that kind of um, effect or under that order would um, be harming or significantly compromising the provision of services by entities in a critical infrastructure sector, significantly disrupting the availability of a computer network, or causing significant misappropriation of funds or economic resources, trade secrets, personal identifiers, or financial information for commercial or competitive advantage or private gain. Like, you know, such as stealing like a bunch of people's credit card information or something like that. Okay, um, let's see here. Oh, and then lastly, I almost skipped Executive Order uh, 13694, which blocks the property of certain persons engaging in significant malicious cyber enabled activities. All right, so how do we explain this with the theories we've gone over in this class? Well, Robert Taylor and his colleagues reviewed several theories to explain commuter crime, and one was routine activities theory that says that when there's a convergence of motivated offender, a suitable target, and the absence of a capable guardian, a crime will occur. So due to the rapid increase in the use of computers and the internet, this has increased the number of suitable targets. The insufficient software protection for these types of crimes reveals the absence of a capable guardian. Thus, when motivated offenders are present, they make rational choices by selecting suitable targets that lack capable guardianship. Social process theories such as learning theory and differential reinforcement theory can help explain crimes that are committed by individuals who develop and spread computer viruses. And last up, social structure theories, specifically strain theory, can be considered when attempting to understand internet fraud schemes and corporate espionage. So that basically wraps up our long, long chapter 14 of, you know, uh, white collar crime, uh, organized crime, and cybercrime.